Uh, so yeah, hey everybody, how you all doing? It's uh, nice to be here talking to you all virtually. Uh, as Tanya says there, put messages in the chat. The chat I think is about 15 seconds behind real time. So if you put a message there and I don't answer your question straight away, just wait like 15 seconds and then I'll see that message and I'll be able to uh, sort of follow up and we can get some conversation stuff going. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you today about plain text. Now, you know, plain text is one of these uh, these interesting topics that kind of comes up once in a while. Um, just a quick intro about me. So this, uh, Tanya said, uh, I'm, I'm Dylan Beatty. Um, I run uh, Ursatile, which is an online software training company. I'm actually doing a couple of workshops at the moment with FW Days, who I know Tanya knows very well, and I've done some of their events, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. But if any of you wants to do some uh, JavaScript web component workshops, we got one coming up this weekend. I'm a Microsoft MVP for uh, developer technologies. I run a .NET user group in London. And uh, yeah, I invented a programming language as a joke uh, so that everyone could be a rock star developer. And then the joke got really popular. And now the joke has a reference implementation and semantic versioning. And if you want to check that out, go to codewithrockstar.com, type in your program, you push the button right there in your browser on your phone. If it works, congratulations, you are a rock star programmer. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk to you for an hour about plain text. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, how can you talk about like plain, plain text is just plain text, right? Um, but you know, when we say plain text, uh, someone says, send me a plain text file. What they mean is send me a file that I don't have to do any work. Send me a file that I can just open and see what it says. You know, you talk about, oh, it's uh, the build system that configures plain text files, or it's, uh, yeah, C Sharp, they're just plain text files or whatever. What we actually mean is give me a file I can open in my choice of editor. So it's not like a, you know, Photoshop document or a Matroska video or something proprietary. Give me a file I can open that's easy. And uh, to be able to do that, to send someone a file they can open easily, we actually need to know quite a lot about them. We need to, who is this person? What kind of computer they're using? What language, what alphabet, what culture? All these kinds of things that actually come into play before we can talk meaningfully about text being plain text. Now, text is like a lot of things, anything we do with technology, uh, the great power of technology is somebody can, can have an idea or they can think of something, they can see something in the real world. And we can take those things, those ideas, text, images, video, and we put that into computers somehow. That's the tricky part, part one, that's encoding. Then the technology does something with it. Maybe it just sends it to another place. Like I'm talking to you right now and a video stream from my studio here, that's being encoded, then it's being transmitted to all of you, and then it's getting decoded at the other end. And though when I say something, it gets transmitted to you and you understand, you can share the information that I'm sending to you. And uh, human beings, we invented text about 5,000 years ago. But things didn't get exciting until about 150 years ago when we had this good idea, hey, what if we combine text with electricity? Because we just kind of started inventing electrical things like electric motors and electromagnets. And, uh, you know, somebody thought, hey, I wonder if we could use electricity to do stuff with text. And big challenge there. We have some information. We've written it down because we have alphabets and stuff. How do we turn text into an electrical signal? And then how do we turn it back again at the other end? Now, the earliest successful system that ever did this, it looked like this. It's a thing called a Cook and Wheatstone telegraph system. This was used in England in the 1830s, so nearly coming up on 200 years ago now. And it's probably the first instance anywhere of using electricity to transmit information. Now, Cook and Wheatstone, uh, there's a lot of stuff about that project which still feels familiar nearly two centuries later. Um, Cook was a business person, and uh, Wheatstone was a physicist, he was a scientist. Um, Cook wanted to sell everything. Wheatstone wanted to give it away for free, like open source in 1830, yeah? Um, also, you know, Cook was like, we have to be able to uh, sell these to people with no training because then there'll be a bigger market. And Wheatstone was like, no, 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 come on. People need to read the manual if they want to use our electrical telegraph system. And so they had these arguments that probably sound familiar to anyone who works in technology. You know, do we make it commercial or give it away for free? Do we require training or do we try and, you know, enhance usability, even if it makes the product more expensive to maintain? And what actually happened 
is that Cook won both of them. It became a commercial system, so you had to pay money to buy one of these systems. It was patented. And you had, uh, didn't, there was no training or in theory, no training required to use this. Now, if you look very closely, I've got a diagram here. You see these five needles across the middle. This is kind of how that system worked. And what happened is a pair of needles were connected. There were five wires. And these were talking long wires, like 20, 30 kilometers long. So you got five wires, 20 kilometers long. And what you do is you would connect one pair of these wires to create a circuit. It would flow up in one direction and down along another wire. And so one of those wires would become positive, one would become negative, and two of these needles would deflect. And the needles that deflected, you'd look where they were pointing and you would read that letter. That's how you read a signal off the Cook and Wheatstone system. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about the history of text and stuff, you know, we're talking about ASCII and uh, Unicode and EBCDIC and all these things that we're going to think about today. And sometimes people are like, ah, ASCII is kind of complicated. It's eight bits of ones and zeros. But actually, the earliest encoding system was the one that was used here on the Cook and Wheatstone system. And it was a seven symbol encoding system. If you have a look at the way characters are encoded, uh, sorry, five symbols. So you've got five symbols, five needles. And each needle can be neutral, or it can be positive, or it can be negative. So this is the encoding table for a Cook and Wheatstone system. And if you send that signal, that corresponds to that line on the encoding. So anytime you feel like you know text processing is difficult, uh, we could have been processing a uh, you know five symbols of uh, true, false, or negative true. Um, <laughs> now the Cook and Wheatstone system had a problem. It used five wires. And uh, that meant that it had five times as many problems as a single wire telegraph system. Anytime anyone was trying to send a signal with this thing, there was a risk one of the wires would burn out. And it did. And then they're like, okay, now we have four wires. Can we send a signal using only four wires? Then one of those wires burned out. So they ended up with a three cable and then two cables. And meanwhile, Across the other side of the Atlantic, a person whose name you may have heard of, Samuel Morse, was working on a single wire telegraph system. And so instead of sending letters, Samuel Morse invented an encoding system. Now, the system that some of you may recognize, this is called International Morse Code. Uh, this isn't actually the code that Samuel Morse invented. Uh, Samuel Morse's system uh, had all sorts of complexity and the dashes could be different lengths. Uh, this was created based on Morse's code by a German engineer, a guy called Friedrich Gerke. And this is international Morse code. This was ratified. They had a big conference in 1865 in Paris, and they decided that international Morse code was going to be the standard that was used by telegraph networks. And this is just about the point where lots of countries are starting to install telegraph equipment. Now, one of the big uh, rules with technology that I'm sure is familiar to everybody is uh, if no one is using your system, you can change anything you want. You can change the signal formats and you can deprecate APIs and change your encodings. But as soon as people are using your system, once people are using it, you can't change it or all your users are going to get upset. And within about 15 years, pretty much everybody in the world was using Morse code for their telegraph systems. And that meant you're never going to be able to change it ever. Like to change Morse code, you would need a really, really good reason to do it. Now, if you look at Morse code, it looks like a binary encoding system, right? You've got dots and dashes, but actually there is a third element to Morse code because Morse code is dots, dashes, and pauses, breaks. And the length of the breaks is important. Morse code is a time-based coding system. You think about like SOS, it's dot, 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 space, dash, 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 space, dot, dot, dot. And those spaces matter, which mean it's not a true binary system. About 100 years after international Morse code is ratified, finally, we got to a point where it's like, we should really rethink this Morse code thing because we had computers. And computers were really good at doing ones and zeros, true and false. They weren't very good at Morse code. Morse code was not a good encoding system for binary computers. And so the American Standards Association, which uh, was the ASA, then it became ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. Um, and they sat down, they did a bunch of work, and they came up with a specification for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. ASCII. Now, ASCII was phenomenally successful. You know, it was first uh, published, it published in 1963, has finally signed off as a standard in 1968. So that's over 50 years ago. And we're still using it. But, you know, 
Asking a developer, hey, what do you think about ASCII is like asking a fish, hey, you know, what do you think about water? They're like, well, it's just stuff, you know, it's everywhere. Why would I have an opinion about it? But have you ever stopped to really think about how ASCII works? Now, the thing you've got to remember with ASCII is it was designed to work on these mechanical teleprinters, and it was designed to be stored on punch cards, physical cardboard cards with holes punched in them as a way of storing ones and zeros. Now, it's probably a couple of decades since anybody actually used a teleprinter or a punch card machine, but ASCII was so successful that making any changes to it was pretty much impossible. So if you look at the ASCII table today, this is the first block of ASCII. Now at the top, at the, the zero position here, we have null, the ASCII null character. Anyone who's done any program with C or C++, you know about null, right? Because null is the thing you're supposed to get to say you're at the end of a string. Then we have a whole bunch of characters which are designed to control mechanical teleprinters. So we got a start of heading, start of text, end of text, end of transmission, inquiry. Now, we don't use most of those, but they do survive in some interesting ways. If you wanted to send a start of heading to your mechanical teleprinter, you would press Control A. If you wanted to send a start of text, code number two, you press Control B. If you wanted to send end of text, you press Control C. And Control C has survived. That's still today, if your program goes into an infinite loop and you need to stop it running, you press Control C. And that's why it goes back to a decision from 1963 about how do you send an end of text control character to stop a teleprinter that is printing stuff it shouldn't be printing. Then, like I said, we got end of transmission, we got the inquiry, we've got an acknowledgement. Uh, number seven, the bell, that's kind of fun. If you're running a uh, on a machine that's running, actually, let me do it, I'll do a live demo this right now. Um, I'm going to open a Windows terminal here. I'll drop that over there. I'm going to press echo, control G, and I'm going to press enter. And you hear that? You get that noise. You get the little Windows alert notification noise. Um, and the other thing you can do, the next one in that sequence there, if we look at what's next in our thing, uh, we got backspace, which is number eight, which is control H. And if I press control H, you can use that if your backspace key doesn't work. So there are all these little weird historical quirks buried in the ASCII character table, which made sense, and then they didn't make sense, but bits of them have survived for all sorts of weird reasons. Now we get onto the next chunk of code here, where we've got uh, the horizontal tabs and line feeds and carriage returns and all that kind of stuff. Now, those mechanical teleprinters that we talked about, right? Uh, things like tabs and carriage returns and line feeds, those were physical. Those were real. Let's have a look. A teleprinter kind of works like this. It's got a print head, a thing called a carriage. And when we print a line of text, it does that. And then we need to return the carriage to the start of the line. That's your carriage return code. And then we need to feed the paper forwards to the next line. Now, if you wanted to do bold on a teleprinter, you couldn't do it just by doing bold because they didn't have bold. They used physical print heads like an old fashioned typewriter. But what you could do is you could print a line and you could back it up and then you could print the same line again and it wouldn't quite line up and you'd get this kind of bold effect. And to do that, you needed to be able to send a carriage return without a line feed. So we have this historical quirk about does it make any sense to have carriage return and line feed as separate characters. Now, uh, people out there who use uh, Linux and Unix and FreeBSD, those kinds of operating systems are like, yeah, we just need to slash in. Whereas Windows is over here going, no, 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 we need slash R slash N, backslash R backslash N. We need carriage return and line feed. You know why? So uh, Linux and Mac OS, they both, both evolved out of Unix. And Unix was developed based on a really early system called Multics. And Multics was the first operating system in history that used device drivers. So a Multics system, there was some software that controlled the relationship between the software and the hardware. There was an abstraction layer. And so when you sent a slash n, it could look at it and go, actually, yeah, let's do this as a slash r slash n, go to the start of the next line. And so the slash ends in your text files would be translated by the device driver so that the teleprinter would do the right thing. Windows 10 is based on Windows 8, which is based on Windows 7, which is based on a, what Vista and XP and Windows NT, which came out in 95, which came out of MS-DOS, which was based on CPM, and CPM was designed to run on mini computers, and mini computers were cheap. 
They were as cheap as they could be because they wanted to sell lots of them to companies. And so mini computers didn't have device drivers. They didn't include that abstraction. So if you wanted to return the carriage and move to the feed to the next line, you had to send a carriage return and a line feed. Of course, .NET has completely solved that problem because we have environment.newline. And in theory, that'll work across multiple systems and multiple platforms, and it'll just use whatever's appropriate for the system that you're running on. Let's have a look at the next block of ASCII. Now, uh, there's some neat ideas here. We got a bunch of punctuation, and one of the things that ANSI or you know the American Standards Association had to do is had to decide what punctuation are we going to include. Um, now, if you look at uh, number 45 there, the hyphen um, in typesetting in English, there's actually four different kinds. There's a hyphen. There is a minus sign. There is what's called an N dash, which is the width of a letter N. And there is an M dash, which is the width of a letter M. They are four different symbols, all used in printed books and typesetting. The ASCII people made a decision, we don't need that. Just one is enough, hyphen. We'll just use that for all of these other characters. But it's interesting now, lots of people, ebooks and you know, reading stuff on screen and digital typography is coming back. A lot of these old symbols that were kind of deprecated because they wouldn't fit in ASCII, we're starting to see those used more again. The next block we got here, we've got the decimal digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, if you want to convert a number into its ASCII string representation or back again, all you've got to do is chop off the top four bits. The bottom four bits give you the value of that digit as a decimal number, as a four-bit decimal. And if you want to turn it back again, you just stick 0, 0, 1, 1 on the beginning. So converting between text and integers was very, very fast, even on computers that only had like a four bit wide register. So they could do that natively. And then we get on to the alphas, the alpha alphabetic characters, or the Latin English alphabetic characters, I should say. Now, did you ever wonder why uh, ASCII A is 65 and ASCII lowercase a is 97? Like why are they 32, 32 spaces apart? Answer is, if you want to do a case insensitive string comparison, you only have to ignore one bit. You chop that one bit out, and a big A and a little a are the same apart from a single bit flag. So you take out that bit, and you can do case insensitive string sorting just by looking at the numeric value of those ASCII things, which is great for sorting records and sorting data. And finally, at the end, we got a little bit more punctuation, just kind of mopping up some things they missed the first time around. And then we have this. 1111111 ASCII code DEL 127. You know why DEL is uh, it's delete is what it means. It's the delete control code. And on a punch card, you can't fill the holes back in. Once you punch the hole in the card, the hole is staying there. So the only way to delete information from that card is to punch out all the rest of the holes as well so that the card can't be read anymore. All the data has been overwritten. That is why the ASCII delete is this, this string of seven ones. Now, the ASCII people congratulate themselves on a job well done. And uh, they go out there and it's like, hey, the American Standard Code says 127 characters is all you'll ever need. And the rest of the world goes, what? We got 127 characters. That's not enough. Um, now, I didn't realize the problem with ASCII until I was about 10 years old, because I grew up in Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe uh, speaks, uh, certainly my, my family and my school spoke English over there. We use the English alphabet and the Zimbabwean currency as the dollar. So dollars and cents. It wasn't until I moved to the UK when I was 10 and I was trying to print some homework that included this symbol here, the British pound sign. Um, and I couldn't get the printer to print it. I was like, this, why, why won't the printer print the pound sign here? And that's when I realized that uh, when the Americans set out to create ASCII, this was one of the symbols that they figured we didn't need because they didn't need it. And so it wasn't included in the standard. Now, for British English, pound sign is about the only thing we're missing. If you go to places like uh, you know Sweden, Denmark, there is a couple of characters in their alphabet that don't exist in ASCII. Um, if you go to Ukraine, it's like no, 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 our entire alphabet is missing here. And if you go to places like you know Korea or Israel, they also have entire languages and cultures that just do not fit into the ASCII character set. And so, what quite a lot of different places did is they looked at ASCII and they went, "Hang on." This is seven bit encoding. Um, there's this big block. We got eight bits to play with, eight bits in a byte, and ASCII only uses seven of them. We've got all this extra space. I wonder if we can use this to do our own thing. And 
everybody around the same time went, brilliant, we've solved the problem. We're going to use the second half of the ASCII table to uh, encode our own alphabet or to extend it and do more interesting things. And everyone did it about the same time and they didn't stop to talk to each other. And so each one of these different systems became known as a code page. Now, this is an example of a code page. This one is famous. This is code page 437, which was built into the IBM PC. Now, if you have a look at this chunk of highlighted text here. Um, this is what they did with the second half of the ASCII block. They used it to include most of the Western European accent characters. So they could write, you know, Swedish, Danish, Icelandic, those kinds of languages. They added box drawing characters. So you could do uh, text mode interfaces on the um, MS-DOS platform. And uh, if you look at the last row there, it looks like they've included the Greek alphabet, but they haven't. They've included about half of the Greek alphabet. Because what they did is they included the characters from Greek that were necessary to be able to write physics equations. So all of the characters in the Greek alphabet that are used in physics and mathematics, they're in there, but you can't actually use code page uh, 437 to write documents in Greek. If you want to do that, you have to use code page 737. Now, the other thing IBM did is they took that top block and they went, we're not using teleprinters anymore. We're going to put different characters into this code page. And if you've ever seen an IBM PC crash and crash hard, it crashes with a screen full of gibberish and little smiley faces and uh, playing card symbols. And the reason is that it's crashed so bad, it's spitting out random ASCII control codes and it's interpreting them in code page 437. And that's why the PC crashes with smiley faces everywhere. Now, there was a code page and still is a code page for uh, working with the, the Cyril or the Russian Cyrillic alphabet, I should say. And uh, the thing about the code page that was created as an extension to ASCII for working with the Cyrillic and the Russian alphabet is that it didn't work very well. It had a big problem. They created a set of code points that said, if you want to encode uh, the Russian word uh, Privet, use these code points, and that gives you this set of bytes, but a lot of symbols, a lot of systems back in the day, they would strip off the eighth bit. They would strip off the top bit, they'd use it for parity, or for flow control, or error correction. And so you'd end up with just seven bits of ASCII coming through the other end. You'd turn that back into symbols, and what you would get out is unreadable nonsense. Now, uh, there is a very, very cool encoding system, the Kod Obnena Informatia Vosembit, uh, KOI8. It's IBM code page 878. And what that did is it took the characters from Cyrillic and it said, we're going to encode them not based on the alphabetical order that exists in the Cyrillic alphabet. We're going to do it based on the ASCII characters that they sound like. So if you lost your top bit of those, you'd get this encoding back out. And when you turn that back into ASCII, you would get something that wasn't right, but you could kind of work out what it was that they were trying to say in the first place. Now, the thing about code pages is there's a lot of them. IBM came up with a couple of dozen. Uh, MS-DOS had about 100 of them. IBM came up with their own standards. DOS has some, Windows has some, Apple has some, Adobe and PostScript. And this thing just got you know, out of control. Like if somebody wanted to send you a document, you'd be like, well, what? you need to tell me what code page this is written in. And then hope that code page works on my computer. And uh, if you wanted to write, say, an, an email that had Russian and Hebrew in it, mm -mm, not going to work. There's just no way of doing that. And this kind of wasn't a problem until we invented the internet and the World Wide Web. And we started plugging all the computers into the network and sending email and web pages and stuff backwards and forwards. And uh, by the kind of late 1980s, early 90s, it was clear we needed a better system, that ASCII and code pages wasn't good enough to wire together all the different people and alphabets and cultures on the planet. And so the Unicode Consortium was born. Unicode, the project started in 1988. Uh, the consortium was founded in 1991. And uh, it exists because of this mission statement, to provide a single consistent way to represent each letter and symbol needed for all human languages across all computers and devices. Uh, so let's break that down a little bit. A single consistent way, no code pages, no choice of encodings. You want to be able to look at a series of bits and you know exactly what 
letter of what alphabet that stands for. All human languages, not just the modern ones, they wanted to encode Egyptian hieroglyphics, ancient Sumerian, uh, you know, other dead and archaeological languages, so that people who are doing archaeology research can use Unicode to store and publish their papers. And they wanted this to work across all computers and devices. So they had to make it really good, they had to make it free, and they had to make it something that was compelling enough that all the different operating system and device vendors would be like, well, of course we're gonna support Unicode, why would we not? And the amazing thing is they succeeded. The phone in your pocket right now works with Unicode. The web browser that you're viewing this talk in, that works with Unicode. All these different systems work with Unicode and that's how, kind of how the modern internet and the web work. It's how we can all talk to each other. But let's dig a little bit deeper into what they actually had to do to make that happen. Here are two strings. Are they the same? Uh, drop a drop a comment in the chat if you're watching and tell me, do you think these two strings are the same strings or not? Now, these aren't actually strings. These are substrings because uh, one of them is uh, the, the Russian word Horosho and the other one is the English word exoplanet. And yeah, they look the same, right? They're the same shape, but they are different sounds. One is the H sound. The other one is exo, the exo sound. Um, so are they the same or not? Well, let's say they're not, because they sound different. We're going to decide those are different letters. But what about um, these two? Are they the same? The same sound, t, and uh, tigre, tiger, they're the same sound in a word that means the same thing. Are they the same letter? Yes or no, you know. Because we have some letters which are identical across lots of different alphabets. And we have some letters where the same shape means different sounds in different contexts. And then we have some letters that don't occur in any other alphabets. So uh, let's backtrack a bit. Now, when it comes to uh, you know English and the original ASCII, I'm gonna take a word like this one. Uh, so this word is Norwegian. And I don't speak Norwegian, I don't read Norwegian, I read English. So when I look at this word, my English speaking brain ignores those bits, takes them out and says harfona, which is not a thing, that's not a word. This. Uh, these letters are the, the, the uh, A with a circle on the OR and the O with a slash through it is, I think it's a kind of ear sound. So it's a hochferner, which is hairdryer. It's a Norwegian word for hairdryer. So when I try and read this, everyone falls around laughing because they're like, ha 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 what even is this thing? Um, and I buy the drinks and we all have a good laugh and it's just kind of funny. But you know, there is this long complicated history of borrowing characters from other alphabets when we need to communicate certain kinds of things. Let's meet some of our friends of mine. This is a Francois Borda, who is a, an archeologist, and this is the rock band Motley Crue. And uh, Francois, the archeologist, went to the Motley Crue concert. Now this sentence is in English, but there are characters here which are not part of the English alphabet. There is this uh, letter C with a cedilla, la cedilla underneath it. There is an A and E here, which is a, a ligature. Those have been mashed together. And then we've got an O with an umlaut and a U with an umlaut, which is the heavy metal umlaut, which is a thing American and British rock bands do because they think it looks cool. And uh, first time Motley Crue went to Germany, in German, that's a different letter of the alphabet. It's not an O, it's an U. Uh. So uh, the, the Motley Crue are playing in Germany and the crowd's all shouting, Mertle Crue, Mertle Crue, and the band have no idea. Why are they getting our name wrong, dude? It's like, because you're spelling your name with different letters because you think it looks cool. Now, making Motley Crue look stupid, kind of not a big deal, you know? You ignore the accents and hey, they look pretty stupid to start with. But it's not always that simple. This is Magnus. Uh, Magnus, not, not Magnus Martinson, it's Magnus Mortensen. Uh, Magnus is a, is a friend of mine from Sweden who does a whole bunch of stuff with Azure and uh, you know Microsoft Cloud Services. And a little while ago, Magnus was traveling to the United States to speak at a conference there. And uh, Magnus has a Swedish passport which lists his name, and then in this little strip down the bottom, which has to be in ASCII so computers can read it, the Swedish government says that his name Mortensen is M-A-A, -A, because the R with a circle above it, that translates into two A's. Now the people who printed Magnus airline ticket, they don't care about the Swedish government, they're just gonna ignore the little circle because they don't know what it means. So Magnus arrives at the border of the United States with a passport that says his name is Mortensen and a boarding pass that says his name is Martinson. And uh, you know, the US border control, 
They are famously friendly, forgiving people. He had to answer some quite complicated questions before they'd let him in. And, uh, you know, Magnus is a, he's a smart, well-dressed European white guy going to, to going to a technology conference. You imagine how differently that might have played out for all kinds of other people who came up against a similar problem. Now, we're only just getting warmed up. Let's take a look at this list of European cities. Berlin, Aachen, Zurich, Aarhus, and Erbro. Now, I'm going to put these into a SQL Server database, and I'm just going to declare a, a table called Cities. I'm going to put a Varchar column on it, and I'm going to insert into it Berlin, Aachen, Zurich, Aarhus, Erbro. And now when I select from cities, there it is. I put my data in, I got my data out. Let's get Orbro back out. Let's select star from cities where name equals Orbro and uh, zero, zero rows, nothing returned, which is not quite, uh, maybe it's case sensitive. Maybe I need to use a capital O. And I run it again and zero rows come back. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Let's just do a little quick sanity check. Let's see, uh, does Orbro even equal Orbro? Uh, does it? No, it do what? what do you mean it doesn't? The reason it doesn't is we haven't told SQL what collation to use. A collation is a set of rules for saying what strings are equal to what other strings. And if I say alphabetical order, what order do I mean? What do I want you to use? So what I've said here is if uh, Erbro equals Orbro, now Ur is a different letter of the alphabet in Sweden. If I say, no, 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 don't use Swedish, use the Latin general collation, case insensitive. So this is Latin general CI means case insensitive, AI means accent insensitive. Ignore the case, ignore the alphabets. Just uh, do your best job. Tell us, do these things look the same? Yes, they do. So getting warmed up with collations. So that's collations for comparing. Are two strings the same on that? Now, if we go in here and we say, uh, let's declare, select some cities order by name, and we're going to get out Berlin, uh, Aachen, Aarhus, Berlin, Erbro, Zurich. That's kind of what we expect. If we do it with the Latin case insensitive, accent insensitive collation, we get something that looks like alphabetical order to American and British people. Now let's do the same thing, but this time I'm gonna say, ah, let's now use the rules of the alphabet that apply in Finland and Sweden. The Finnish and Swedish case insensitive, accent insensitive collation. We now get Orobro at the end because the letter O appears after Z at the end of the Swedish and the Finnish alphabets. Now's where it's going to get really exciting. Danish and Norwegian alphabetical order. Berlin comes first, then Zurich, then Erbro, then Aachen, then Aarhus. And you might be looking at that going, but why are Aachen and Aarhus appearing at the end of that? Well, there is a rule that says that the double A in the Norwegian and Danish alphabets should be treated as if it is a separate letter of the alphabet. Now, this is where it gets really complicated. This is Aarhus. Aarhus is the second biggest city in Denmark. It's the second city after Copenhagen. And uh, the city of Aarhus has changed its name, or not changed its name, it's changed the spelling of its name twice in the last hundred years. In 1948, they changed the spelling from uh, Aarhus with two A's to Aarhus with a single A with a, a circle above the top of it. The reason for this, there was a thing called the Danish spelling reform. 1948, Denmark voted that they were going to change the alphabet so that they were less like Germany and more like Sweden. Um, you can figure out for yourself why they might have done that. But what it meant is they added three new letters to the end of the Danish alphabet. And they made a rule that said any uh, place names and people's names that used to be AA, now they are spelt with this new letter or, and that goes at the end of the alphabet after Z. So Danish alphabetical order is Aachen, Berlin, Dublin, Zurich, Aarhus. Fine. Then in 2011, the city of Aarhus changed its name back because of search engine optimization and tourism, which meant that technically that now had to be at the end of the alphabet because it's a place in Denmark. Aachen is not in Denmark. Aachen is in Germany. So Aachen stays at the beginning because it's a German place, but Aarhus goes at the end because it is a Danish place. Now, if you show this, I showed this to some friends of mine from uh, uh, Norway and Denmark, and they went, well, yeah, obvious. And I'm like, but how do you know that? And they're like, well, it's just, if it's a place in, in Scandinavia, it goes at the end. And if it's a place that's not in Scandinavia, it goes at the beginning. Now, 
computers cannot get this right because computers have no idea which place names are Scandinavian and which ones are not. If this is a requirement on a system you're working on, and this kind of stuff crops up all over the world. There's weird rules about how they sort phone numbers in Brazil and how they sort certain kinds of names in uh, British English telephone books and all these kinds of things. If this is a requirement, the only way to fix it is you need to store two names in your database. You need the one that you show people and you need the one that your database is going to use to sort those. And you need to be able to go and override and fudge one of them. So in this example, we said, all right, uh, name and sort name are separate. And the city of Aachen in Germany, we're going to put in a sort name for that, which is a single A, so that that will always appear at the beginning. And now, even if we are using a Danish-Norwegian collation, we get those back in the alphabetical order, which would make sense to customers who are in uh, Denmark and Norway. Now. People sometimes say, oh, yeah, you know, I just, I do technology. I don't worry about history and politics and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then they go, hey, I'm using Norwegian Windows. Why is my aardvark.txt file in the wrong place? To really understand how technology works, you need to understand why the decisions were made. You need to understand what was going on at the time somebody decided that Norwegian and Danish alphabetical order was going to put AA at the end. And to understand that, you have to understand the context. You've got to understand, you know, if you try and select all the technology which has nothing to do with politics, there's nothing there. There is nothing. All of this, the stuff we work with every day, is a consequence of decisions made by human beings based on reality. And only if you understand the history and the politics and the context around it, will it make any kind of sense why the computers do all this weird stuff that initially you look at and you're like, what? Now, let's go back to our friend Francois and the, the La Cédilla, this little hook underneath the sea. Now, how are we going to write that? The point about Unicode, Unicode isn't telling people what to do. Unicode was just trying to document what human beings were doing already. And it turns out that, you know, in the, in the French alphabet, this is a letter. There is a letter in the, in the French alphabet. And so they went, all right, well, if you're writing French Unicode, we'll just give you a code point. This code here, 00C7, that is the C or the Cédia. But if you're writing English and you're used to doing a C and then adding the accent afterwards, we'll give you a way of doing that as well. We'll give you code 43, which is the same as it's always been in ASCII. And then we'll give you this thing here, which is a combining character, Unicode point 0327. And that says, whatever you just drew, put one of these under the bottom of it, add the little hook underneath. So this gives us two different ways of rendering the same character. Now these combining characters, you might've seen those online because if you take a character Z, and you add a hook, and you add one of these, and one of those, and one of those, and you keep adding all these combining characters to it, you get Zalgo text, which uh, some of you have probably seen on Stack Overflow posts talking about Tony the Pony parsing HTML with regular expressions, or on forum posts, and that's what Zalgo text is is it's regular ASCII with way too many combining characters stacked up onto it. Sometimes it'll render, other times it'll actually fall over and uh, crash browsers and renderers and certain kinds of things. Now, let's take a look at uh, Dobri Den. Now, we have this, this word here, Dobri, and uh, we could spell Dobri like this, or we could spell Dobri like this, by using a Unicode combining character to put the accent over the last Y on the end of this, this word here. So they're both valid. They represent the same sound. They will render the same. They will print the same. They will read the same. But are they the same string or not? Now, again, Unicode doesn't tell us what to do. Unicode just gives us options to choose from. And uh, what we got onto here is something called Unicode normalization. Now, we have four different forms, four different ways of comparing two strings and saying, are these equal or not? Uh, they are called, uh, so C and D here stand for composed and decomposed. And then K stands for canonical. Composed means reduce this into the smallest number of characters you can and then see if it's the same. Decomposed is the opposite. Break this out into the biggest number of characters you can and see what we get. And then the canonical is, never mind what it looks like, does it represent the same section of the same alphabet? 
So if we run this example here, um, we got our, our old our old pals Motley Crue or Mert Le Crue, and now in the second example here, we've got M, we've got O, regular ASCII, but then we've got Unicode 0308, which is a combining diuresis. It's the heavy metal umlaut. So we're going to plug that in, and then we're going to run this through our little .NET sample here. And this is going to say, well, there's your two strings. They're the same length. They look the same. Are they binary equivalent? They are not. S1 equals equals S2 is false. But under all four types of Unicode normalization, they are considered equal. However you look at it, it's not the same bits, but those two strings are always the same. Let's have a look at another one. So as well as normal ASCII, there's a bunch of Unicode characters for ASCII in little circles, which looks cool because people use it in their Twitter handles and stuff. So we've got plain text in circles, and we got plain text in plain text. Are they the same? Let's run our comparison function across that. And what we get here is, so first of all, the DOS terminal or the, the Windows terminal can't actually print those capital letters because they're not in the font that my terminal is using here. Um, but we are printing, they're the same length. S1 equals S2, false. They're different, binary different. Um, C and D, they are false. They are not the same. But if we say canonical C versus canonical D, then it goes, well, yeah, it's the letters P-L-I-A-N space T-E-X-T. It means the same thing. So if you're doing something like a you know dictionary search or you're doing a text search or a regular expression replace and you want to find someone who's written their username using these fancy Unicode characters, you need to use a canonical uh, normalization form. Otherwise, you're not going to find them. Now, my sort of first uh, insight into the wonderful world of Unicode happened about four or five years ago. I went into work one day and uh, one of my team said, dude, I think we've been hacked. Now, this happens a lot if you work in IT because everyone thinks they've been hacked all the time. And it's like, you haven't been hacked. It's a spam email. Don't worry about it. They don't really have your password. You've accidentally done, you know, right click, view source, uh, all these kinds of things. But on this occasion, it was a little different. The person who said that I think we've been hacked, they were a really, really good security engineer. And I said, okay, um, why do you think we've been hacked? There's Chinese in the event logs. I'm like, no, 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 come on. And he's like, no, come and have a look. And I went and had a look. And there is Chinese in the event logs. Now, this is a company based in London who sell uh, software to mostly English-speaking people in the UK and Western Europe. We have no Chinese uh, support in our system. We have no Chinese characters in our database. Uh, we do not do business with anyone in China. Why is there Chinese in the event log? So. At this point, what I do is I say to one person, right, you let everyone know we might have a problem here. We'll give them an update in 20 minutes. You go and check the firewall log, see if there's anything weird. Look for any IP addresses coming from mainland China or anything. You uh, go and look through the database. See if there's any Chinese data in there. See if maybe you know someone's done a SQL injection attack or some such thing. And because everyone else was busy fixing the problem, I did what I sometimes do, which is I sit and I talk on Twitter about how my day is going. And I said, ah, oh, the incoming tabular data stream is incorrect. And somebody replies with, hey, that looks like a Unicode mapping error. And uh, the fake Unicode Twitter account, which is a lot of fun, pops up with, yep, the low bits are all null. So this is UTF-16 LE being mistaken for UTF-16 BE or vice versa. And I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, I should probably figure out what LE and BE are very, very quickly while uh, <laughs> I still can. Now, I read very, very fast, and I looked up some documentation, and I dug through a couple of things. And what I learned that day is that uh, there are two different ways. Operating systems, so Windows, Mac OS, Java, JavaScript, lots of systems, internally, they store every character as two bytes. UTF-16, 16 bits for each character. And that means there's two different ways of doing it. You can do it with the big end first, BE, or the little end first, LE. Now, if you take a word like delete and you put that in UTF-16, this is the stream of values you get. And if you flip those around so that they're backwards, and then you turn that back into text, you get Chinese in the event logs. Uh, we ran the Chinese through Google Translate. Um, the first character there means uh, to place a precious gem in the mouth of a corpse, and the second one means preparing a chicken for slaughter. So uh, clearly this wasn't like a message from anyone. This was just machine noise. But this looked promising. This looked like what had happened there. Now, 
why had our database server flipped from big Endian to little Endian? Well, it hadn't. What had happened is that one of the network switches on the virtual network between the CRM system and the SQL box, it had a problem. And it was dropping one byte from the data stream occasionally. And it was dropping the byte, which meant everything else was going shifted sideways. It wasn't resequencing it. It was just going, all right, this is the data stream. And boom, there it is. Chinese coming out in the event logs. Now, why is the systems like Windows use UTF-16? You know, why would it make, make sense to do this? Well, there's a lot of reasons. If all your characters are the same length, searching in strings is really fast. You can calculate byte offsets really, really quickly. Um, it means that your storage is predictable. If you have a certain number of characters, you know how much memory you need to allocate. Lots of operating system level type things where you know memory is cheap and storage is local and everything is relatively quick. UTF-16 works much, much better for those kinds of internals. But it doesn't work so well for something like publishing pages on the World Wide Web. Because uh, let's say we had a, a web page that just said uh, Privit in Ukrainian. So here's our web page. And here is that web page in UTF-16. Now, even though the content of this page is in Ukrainian, so it's using the Cyrillic alphabet, HTML is based on ASCII. All of our tags and angle brackets and attributes, all of those are ASCII. So if we highlight this is the bit of that document that needs Unicode, and this is the amount of data that we are using just to send nulls, just to send 00, zero empty bytes, because it's a UTF-16 character that only has plain 7-bit ASCII in it. This is 210 bytes of data here. 93 of those bytes are 00. zero. So this, the 44% redundancy, this web page is going to take twice as long to download as it's supposed to because we have to download all those zeros. And yet it takes just as long to transmit zero as it does to transmit anything else because the thing on the other end has to verify that it's actually a zero and it's not another character that accidentally came out as a zero. So we want a better system. We needed a better way of saying, look, most of the stuff on the web is ASCII. The stuff that's not, it's really important that that gets through okay. But the ASCII stuff, we don't want to carry all these extra empty bytes of data around just to be able to encode that. So the Unicode Consortium came up with something called UTF-8, which I think is just beautiful. UTF-8 starts with a rule. Any byte that starts with a zero, that is 7-bit ASCII, same as it was back in 1968. That has not changed. But any byte starting with a 1 is part of a multi-byte character sequence. If you see a byte starting 1-0, that's a continuation. It says you're in the middle of a character here. You need to rewind, back it up a little bit, um, go back to where you find a 1-1, one, one, and then work forwards from there, and you'll find the whole sequence. If the beginning starts 1-1-0, one, 1-1, one, 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 two bytes. If it starts 1-1-1-0, one, 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 that's three ones. It's a three-byte sequence. 1-1-1-1, one, 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 that is a four byte sequence. Um, you could in theory go up to an eight byte sequence. The reason they don't is because at that point you can't round trip into anything else. There's a system called UTF-32, which is what uh, you know Windows and JavaScript use if you have stuff that doesn't fit in UTF-16. And if we had eight bits, you'd need UTF-200 and fill or something huge. <laughs> um, and at that point, there's no round tripping. So they deliberately cap UTF-8. They said, we're not going to go any higher than a four byte encoding. But it turns out four bytes is plenty. You know, uh, four bytes gives us enough to encode all the alphabets that human beings have ever used, but also all the new alphabets that we're making up. And uh, some of you are thinking, but we're not making up new alphabets. Well, we are. It turns out that human beings will not stop inventing new languages. There is a completely new language with a new alphabet that did not exist in 1991 when the Unicode Consortium was founded. It's an incredibly popular language. It is used all over the world. I bet most of you have used it today. Um, and you probably not even thought about it. It is the language called Emoji. Emoji didn't exist in 1991. Uh, they were invented in 1999 as an artist called uh, Shigetaka Kurita, who was working for uh, Docomo, it's a Japanese mobile phone company, on a platform called iMode, which was an internet data messaging service for Japanese mobile phone handsets. And uh, they wanted to do something a little bit more imaginative than, than just text. And so uh, he designed this set of emoji. These are now in display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is the original set of 176 emoji. And uh, pretty soon, yeah, everyone in Japan loved these. They're like, 
oh, emoji is the best thing ever. We want phones that do that. And within about a year, every mobile phone in Japan had emoji support. And if your phone didn't support emoji, no one's going to buy it. And so when Apple released the iPhone in Japan in 2008, they had to include emoji support because no one was going to buy a phone in Japan that didn't have emoji in it. Now, Everyone else around the world realizes that if they activate the Japanese language keyboard, they can write emoji. They send their friends text messages. The friends come back and go, oh, that's really cool. Emoji explodes worldwide. And people start asking all kinds of questions like, uh, why is there sushi here? But I can't see tacos. And uh, why is the, the police and the chef and the doctor, why are they all white men? Actually, they're yellow men, kind of Simpsons, yellow cartoons. But why are they all male? You know, uh, why are there flags for, you know, China and Korea? But why is there no flag of Palestine? And Unicode's suddenly like, wow, this, this is getting a little bit political, isn't it? Um, now, in 2015, Unicode took a massive step towards uh, you know, inclusivity by including the option to change the skin tone that was used on emojis that show people. And the way they did it is actually really clever. You remember earlier, we were looking at how you could use Unicode combining characters to add accents. Well, what they did is they said, all right, we got this Unicode uh, 1F44D. That's the code for a thumbs up. We're going to add a modifier character for different tones of human skin. So if you want to, you can take a thumbs up and you can combine it with this modifier and you'll get thumbs up with the medium dark skin tone. And uh, if the handset or the device you're sending it to doesn't support that, it's just gonna draw those two symbols side by side instead of combining them, which is fine. It still gets the meaning across. It's also an obvious single signal to the handset manufacturer, hey, you should hurry up and support this. People want this thing because they're getting messages on your platform. Now. There is a whole bunch of really, really cool stuff going on with the way the emoji spec is designed. And every year, they add a whole bunch of new characters and glyphs to the emoji. This is the ones from the end of 2020. And, you know, we're starting to get all of these different combinations of, uh, you know, ethnicity and gender and relationships and family configurations, all these different ways that human beings kind of want to go, hey, that picture looks like me, that picture looks like my family. And Unicode has not gone in and added individual characters for every single one of these. What it's done is it's used the technology that already exists in the encoding system to let us add new things to it. Now, if we want to send someone a Unicode female astronaut, uh, the way you do this is you send the emoji code for a woman, then you include this thing. This is called a zwitch, zero width joiner, Unicode 200D. And the zero width joiner says, I want you to combine that symbol and this symbol together. And if you can, draw that as a single glyph. So if you send woman with a zwitch and a rocket on handsets that support it, that means female astronaut. And if they don't support it, you get a woman and a rocket, which is fine. And you can combine switches with modifier characters. So you can say, all right, well, let's send woman plus the dark skin tone modifier plus the zero width joiner plus the rocket. And you get this glyph here, which uh, is a pretty good representation of Mae Jemison, who flew the space shuttle back in the 1980s. Now, there's all these different ways of encoding different things into the Unicode system. Let's have a look at flags, because I think flags is really interesting. If you want to send the flag of Ukraine, there is a block of letters in Unicode called the Regional Indicator Symbol Letters. And if you send a U plus an A from that block of characters, devices that support it will go, oh, it's a flag. Flag UA, yep, Ukraine, I know that one. Let's draw it. Blue and yellow, there it is. Now, that works for countries that have an ISO country code. England is not a country, according to the ISO. Uh, I'm in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's a country that has the code GB, but that doesn't have this flag. This is the flag that like the England football team and stuff use. So to send this flag as an emoji, you send the black flag, and then there is another block of letters in Unicode, which are the tag Latin letters. And if you send GB for Great Britain, ENG for England, that's how you get the England flag come out the other end. Same thing is used for the flag of Scotland, the flag of Wales, and the flag of Texas as well is in the Unicode uh, character set on some handsets now. And that is black flag plus USTX is how they get that one. Um, the pride flag is a white flag, a zero width joiner, and a rainbow. And devices that support it will interpret that and they will draw the rainbow pride flag. Now, <clears throat> this flag here, this flag belongs to the Republic of China. 
not the People's Republic of China. The Republic of China is the country that most of us know as Taiwan. And the Taiwanese flag is politically sensitive in mainland China, the PRC, People's Republic of China. Because if you fly this flag, you can get in trouble with the authorities because China doesn't like the idea of Taiwanese independence. Now, there's a lot of people in China with a lot of money who buy a lot of phones. And so this puts device manufacturers in a slightly difficult position. Have a look. This I took these screenshots on my iPhone, my Apple iPhone. Type in Taiwan. I tap the emoji. There it is. I get that flag. But then if I go into my region settings and I change my phone's location to China mainland and I go back and I look at that message again, the flag has disappeared. And if I open the emoji keyboard, the flag of Taiwan is not there anymore. It's vanished. This was the decision Apple made. They're like, we want to sell iPhones in China. There's a market of, you know, 3 billion people or something. Um, we don't want the Chinese government uh, banning Apple products. We don't want to get interrogated for anti-political activities. We'll just take the Taiwanese flag out. Now, you think Apple's approach to that is a little bit heavy-handed. Um, go onto my Twitter profile on a machine that runs Windows and have a look at it, because I got this little European Union flag in my Twitter handle. Now, if I get to edit that on a Windows PC, what comes up is this. The letters E and U, I don't see the flag at all. There are no regional flags in Windows. The Windows operating system does not support any country flags at all. I uh, gather, you know, I, I've, I've sort of can speculate that their approach to the whole problem of Taiwan and China is just like, yeah, no flags. We're just not going to do any. Um, the pirate flag, the skull and crossbones is in there, um, and the gay pride flag is in there. So the only flags that you can fly in Microsoft Windows are gay pirate flags, which I think if you're going to only pick two flags, those are probably two pretty good ones to go for. Now, we're kind of on the home stretch now. There's one more thing that I want to share with you, which is another way of doing interesting things with the way text gets rendered. Now, I could probably do a whole talk about how Unicode ends up on your screen and what controls the thing it looks like. Um, but what I want to show you is this is the logo for my company, Ursatile. And if you look very closely, you'll see that the T and the I there, they're kind of joined together. Now, that's not a different character. That's not an emoji. That's not a special glyph. The text here is regular text. What that is, it is something that is built into the font. The font I'm using here for the logo type is a font called Leto, and Leto supports something called ligatures. And ligatures are brilliant because ligatures are what lets us write code that looks like this. Take a look at this for a couple of seconds, um, and you know, tell me if you, or stick a thing in the chat, if you know what language this is written in. Now, this is F-sharp, and this is plain text. The file behind this is regular ASCII. There is nothing in this file which is not part of the basic ASCII character set. So where do these weird characters come from with the arrowheads and the pointers? And so this is what the file actually looks like in a different font. But this is what it looks like when I open it in Visual Studio Code. The reason is I'm using an editor font here called Fire Code. And Fire Code is full of ligatures. All the programming double equals and triple equals and arrow operators and stuff, Fire Code includes ligatures for all of those. They make your code look more readable. They make your code look kind of cool. They are also, you know, things like triple not equal to. Um, you get a distinct glyph for that, which can make it much easier in your writing, you know, languages like JavaScript to see whether you've made a mistake or not. So that's the Fire Code font. Your code is still ASCII, but Fire Code makes it look like this. It uses all these extended glyphs. So that's pretty much it. Now I just want to leave you with one one little story. First time I visited Ukraine, which was back in 2015. Here's the the, the, the pictures of my trip and the hotel we stayed in and stuff. And I was wandering around and. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't read the alphabet, didn't speak any language. You know, I couldn't even read road signs. I couldn't read menus. I couldn't read the signs on the bars and the beers and stuff. But I could read the license plates on the cars. And I kind of didn't notice at first. And I was like, hang on a second. Um, I can't read Ukrainian. How come I can read everything that's written on all the license plates? And I did a bit of research. I found out something really interesting. Now, uh, if you go back to the days when ASCII was being first ratified, license plates in uh, in Ukraine or in the Soviet Union as well, then they look like this. They use 
characters I can't read because I couldn't read that alphabet. Now, there was a thing called the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. It was ratified in 1968, same year as ASCII, by 36 countries, including the Soviet Union. And one of the items of that treaty was that if you were going to take your car to another country, your license plate could only use Latin alphabet characters. You couldn't use Cyrillic, you couldn't use Hebrew, you had to use Latin alphabet. And, uh, so I've asked a couple of people, like, how did the Soviet Union sign the Vienna Treaty when they had Cyrillic? They're like, a, nobody took their car out of the Soviet Union in the 1960s. And that, I guess, kind of answered the question. Um, but if you did, if you were able to do that, they would give you different license plates at the border when you left. And they'd give you temporary plates that were valid for driving overseas, and then you'd have to change them when you got back. Now, uh, when kind of, you know, the Soviet Union uh, broke up in the 1990s, most of the states overhaul the way they do their license plate registration. And that's why when I go to places now like Ukraine and Belarus, I can walk around the street and I can read all the characters on the license plates. And the way that they did this, I actually think is really clever. What, what most of them did is they looked at the alphabets, the Western alphabet and the Cyrillic alphabet, the Ukrainian alphabet, the Belarusian alphabet, and they went, we got this bit in the middle that overlaps. We have these shapes, not the same letters, not always the same sound, but it's the same shape. It's the same glyph, which means those letters are readable by people who speak and read all of these different languages. And so those are the letters that are used on license plates in Ukraine and Belarus. And if you take those letters in English and you mix them up and turn them into words, what you get is the phrase pike matchbox. So what I want you all to remember is when somebody says to you, hey, send me a plain text file, you turn around to them and go, do you know about Pike Matchbox? And if they say, oh yeah, yeah, Pike Matchbox, they've seen this talk and they know about encoding systems. They know about teletype. They know about delete and code pages and all of the other things that we've talked about. And so you can assume when they send you plain text, they've done their homework and they are going to send you a file that you are going to be able to read. And if they say, no, what's Pike Matchbox? It means they have no idea. They're going to send you a file. And whether you can read that or write that is anybody's guess. Because as we've seen in this talk, there really is no such thing as plain text. Jakuyu community, thank you very much for tuning in.